right now we're actually in a better competitive advantage because e-commerce stores are killing Sears, are killing Kmart, are killing Literally. Walmart, are killing Main Street and you know uh, retail stores. And so the reason is because, like I said before, they don't have we don't have the bureaucracy. We don't we can we can test concepts, we can cut concepts. We don't have big you know bloated infrastructure that we have to carry. We can move quick, think quick, test quick, scale quick, cut back quick, and move on quick. Yep. That's something that was unprecedented. And in, in the, the, there's never been a time in mankind where the common person, somebody like me, I don't even have a, I didn't even graduate high school. I never definitely went to college where I'm running a multi million dollar business from my apartment. And, you know, and I'm running circles around some of these big brands right now and these big companies because they just can't keep up with the creativity and the speed of implementation that my company has. Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, I am lucky to have Ronnie Sandlin, the founder and operator of the School of Hidden Knowledge, a uh, education platform that teaches, among other things, uh, <laughs> oh, we lost him. Sorry. He's back. He's I back. actually didn't fall, just my webcam. Don't nice. be alarmed. No worries. He's, he's all good. He, he has a medical alert bracelet just in case. Yes. But he teaches... Uh, you know, the hidden knowledge is essentially a it's affiliate marketing, entrepreneurial knowledge, but it's also some of the it's about the hidden drivers that make people behave in certain ways and want certain things. And it's the stuff that you may not always think about. Uh, and it's a way that you can think about reaching your customer in sort of a in, in a fairly profound way from from what I've come across. So thanks for coming on the podcast today, Ronnie. How you doing? Sure. Great. Thank you for having me, Eric. I, I'm stoked. I love the stuff that that you guys put up. I love the podcast. I'm, I'm excited and humbled that you have invited me here. Yeah, well, when I first got into the space, um, and I was just kind of looking around there, I think I think I reached out early on, right when I was getting started. And uh, I kind of saw what you what you were up to and, and knew that you were so talk a little bit about what you're doing in this space. You're an independent affiliate. And uh, but you've also got this school. So so run us through your hero's journey, basically. All right. Well, yeah, so totally. So you know, I, I started like most people, struggling, you know, seeing, knowing that there's a lot, a lot of money to be made online, unsatisfied with any career prospects that I had. I actually never went to college. So I was in boiler rooms and sales at their sales job. Very unhappy, typical before and after affiliate and uh, experimented with quite a few things. And I remember a point in my life where I was like, if I could just figure out how to make five grand a month online, I would be the happiest guy in the world. And that, that's funny to me now to think of like how short I was selling myself. But my big aha moment and my kind of, kind of when I, I felt like I started really fulfilling that hero's journey arc was when I woke up um, one morning and I had written an advertorial. And this is what got me in my copywriting journey, really just going deep into this journey. Uh Oh, it's happening again. <laughs> Not an earthquake, guys. Everything's OK. Um, OK, so basically I woke up and I, I, I wrote an advertorial, went to sleep. Uh, Okay. Well, I launched it that morning when I went to sleep because uh, it was kind of one of those paper call things where you have to wake up early at call center thing. Anyway, uh, anyway, I'd made a thousand bucks when I had woken up and I'd never made more than like two or three hundred bucks online. And that was the big aha moment for me where I was like, man, there's there's this copywriting thing and understanding uh, how to get inside that person's head and understand who your prospects are. There's so much more to this than I was even aware of. And it really brought me down the rabbit hole and beyond the hero's journey, more into a rabbit hole of how deep persuasion and influence goes and how little of it is being taught in our industry right now and how powerful it is and how powerful it's been for me and the, and the people I've shared this information with. Very cool. Now, uh, as far as hero's journeys go, I, I'm watching a lot of Moana these days. And I know that because uh, I've got a three-year-old and she's obsessed with it. Uh, but I know that sometimes you have to go into the realm of monsters to complete your your hero's journey. So it doesn't sound like it's absolutely a, a, out of the normal here. So just let's talk a little bit about what some of that hidden knowledge is like. What is it, you know, what is it that allows you to get inside, or what are some of the tactics you use essentially to get inside your your consumer's head when you're trying to write copy for them? I came across some of your your stuff where you were talking about. 
Uh, you know, a lot of traditional people talk about features and benefits. You really just got to hammer features and benefits. But I feel like what you advocate is going at least one or two levels deeper than that even. Not just like, hey, you don't need a, you know, you don't always need a hammer. You need a, you need a, a hole. And the question is, why do you need that hole? Like why, you know, you go even further to talk about like the why and like what are people's pain points? What are people's insecurities, for instance? What, what are, well, yeah, what are some of the tactics you use to dig deep? Well, you know, there's, there's, there's already these, Pre, there's these systems that work. So going back to what you said was actually very insightful and profound where you said you have to go and fight the monster, become the hero, where there's actually this scene in Star Wars that I'm going to and I'm going to show you how this all ties in. But there's a scene in Star Wars where Luke Skywalker and, and Yoda go to this cave and Yoda says, you're not ready. And he goes in and he says, you're going to go fight your, your 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 biggest monster. And Luke Skywalker goes in and it's Darth Vader, but it's like kind of this dream sequence. We've all seen the sequence and he, he kills Darth Vader and he takes off the mask and it's himself, which is such an allegory for our biggest monster and our biggest person that we have to defeat is ourself in order to continue this journey. But also once you understand how powerful those symbolisms are and how powerful stuff like that can be when you embed that in your copy, that that is is extreme power and that I use when putting my copy together. And I, I use a lot of, of young um, Young's work, Carl Young's work and the people that have gone uh, after Young, his students, such as um, uh, uh, not, not Edward Bernays, uh, uh, Joseph Campbell, who wrote Hero with a yeah. Thousand Faces. You can just read Hero with a Thousand Faces. And if you apply that in your methodology and writing copy and even vertical discovery, there's so much money to be made because now you're understanding this psychological journey that goes on in people's minds that makes it irresistible. If, like, for example, the flashlight. Who knew a flashlight was going to be such a breakthrough product in our industry? But it was that person that was able to put that two and two together and say, protect your family. And it became not a tool anymore that everyone had. Everyone has a flashlight. It became a survival mechanism. A lightsaber even. A lightsaber, <laughs> a tool, a weapon, a way yeah. to protect your family and yourself. Yeah. That person that created that copy was tapping into that very, very deep, deep leveled, seeded stuff in our brain. It's irresistible. It's like he took a, a blue chip product, a product that, quite frankly, everyone already had in their garage already and made it everyone buy two or three more of them at an extremely high price. So that's how powerful this stuff is. And the thing is, because so many affiliates have just scratched the surface of the power of this, they're just a photocopy of a photo. They know that the tactical flashlight works, but they don't know the psychology behind why the tactical flashlight works. And once you understand the psychology, you can make anything work. You can make toilet paper. You can make toothbrush. You can make, I mean, the whole industry is open, open for this type of strategies. And that's why, that's what makes me so excited. Yeah. Now it's you. You threw off a whole lot of stuff there. So first of all, for people that aren't familiar with Joseph Campbell, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are. But like when I start these podcasts by talking about the hero's journey, that's specifically what that's about. It's about this idea that in order to is is the idea is that every person is on their own journey in which they are the hero, and there are certain archetypal things along that journey that you sort of have to do. You you know you have to uh, at one point you have to face your father. You have to sort of like and maybe or it's like Pinocchio and you have to redeem your father. You have to go to the bottom of the ocean and to the belly of a whale and uh, and so you know when i when we talk about campbell or i know um jung I, I, i'm really interested in as well as jordan peterson is someone i oh i, I love jordan peterson i've been listening to a lot and he yeah. really understands the power of these archetypes uh as well and you also threw off another really interesting one who's another uh, one of good mine Lord. oh good okay, Lord. sorry that's okay i'm just gonna just stop fucking with <laughs> you also threw off edward bernays now he, yeah. He's a school of Freud. He's from the school of Freud. He's actually Freud's nephew. Yeah, and and yeah, to me, right, it's right. the most interesting story in all of public relations. Probably in all of uh, you know one of the most interesting stories in all of modern culture. And it's this idea that Freud's nephew Edward Bernays took Freud's theories over to America and started the world's first PR firm. And his two examples that always come to mind that I think about were how he you know just super manipulative. How he was uh, cigarette companies came to him and said. 
women aren't smoking. It's taboo for them to smoke. And he's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to tie cigarettes to the suffragette movement. When, when women were fighting for the right to vote, we're going to organize, we're going to orchestrate this event where all these women march through the streets for their own rights. And we're going to get all the news cameras out there. And then at the end of it all, they're going to light their torches of freedom. And they lit up their smokes. And it was this phallic Absolutely. symbol of power. And it like... It totally changed the, uh, the idea of women smoking in the United States to where it became avant-garde and, and cool for right. women to do that. The other one was Duncan Hines cakes w weren't selling because they came up with this new instant line. And housewives at the time were feeling uh, that it was cheating. They couldn't they couldn't get away with, with just making a cake not from scratch. And so Edward Bernays said to them, make them add an egg. And they're like, but we don't need to add an egg. It's already in the cake. He's like, just have them add the egg. Yeah. And that was the Freudian aspect of adding their egg to this thing. And it's yeah. it's really amazing when you dig under the surface, you know, what you can oh. what you can it's, find. It, it's that's why I said it's a rabbit hole that once you go like for me, once I started just going deep into it, I was like, do we even have free choice? Like those types of questions, those like, you know, I started asking myself because it's like wow, there's so much of my life personally that I was affected uh, by because some person was making money and profiting off of my emotions and, and insecurities and fears and all these things. So it's also good to know these things to protect yourself and to understand how powerful these this type of marketing is because I don't see anyone talking about it. I don't see anyone talking about it, especially on this kind of like Machiavellian level. No, as it relates to marketing and as it relates to the society that we live in now as well, right? Like we live in a world – like if, if, we're, if we're talking about these occulted tactics of archetypal manipulation and things like that, you don't think there's some underground lab somewhere in uh, oh, different – You know what well, I mean? You know, like Disney. Disney. There was a reason why Pixar and Disney and, and there's I, – I mean there's so many companies. They already know this. This is not something they're, they're telling everyone because it kind of – once you tell people – it kind of it, once you tell people your strategy, your secrets, it kind of they, they have defenses against it now and it becomes less effective. So Disney's doing this on all their best, biggest Disney movie. They're using these these very, very strong psychological tactics. You don't you know, and all these big brands, you know, are doing it, you know, not onto the level that we can do it now because they're so held back by political correctness and like the corporate bureaucracy that now is be the better, the best time than ever to utilize these strategies without any form of like bureaucratic restriction or any form of actual like reprimand from like a boss or getting fired or having some political correct machine coming after you. you yeah, know, like, like Kendall life. Jenner's Pepsi commercial that brought yeah, the world yeah, down yeah. on them, on the sugar yeah. water company. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, and we're in a position too where we can test out these tactics and we can have results within two hours. We can say, yep, that worked way better yeah. or, or no, you know. Absolutely. And it is a great time to be to be alive for a marketer for sure, and it's and it's the same thing. It's like we talk about Big Brother, we talk about Big Brother and the data, this and that, but it's also an era where we have full access to this data on Facebook as marketers as well, in order to try to elevate yourself, you know, uh, in in a way that that you know you're, you gives yourself freedom, financial freedom, uh, career freedom, all these things. You can actually the oracle is kind of turned over to us at this time, well, and it, and who knows if that'll even... be the case forever. I, I well, right now it is. That's why I tell people we have that window of opportunity because right now we're actually in a better competitive advantage because e-commerce stores are killing Sears, are killing Kmart, are killing Literally. Walmart, are killing Main Street and you know, you know retail stores. And so the reason is because, like I said before, they don't have we don't have the bureaucracy. We don't we can we can test concepts, we can cut concepts. We don't have big you know bloated infrastructure that we have to carry. We can move quick, think quick, test quick, scale quick, cut back quick, and move on quick. Yep. That's something that was unprecedented. And the, the, there's never been a time in mankind where the common person, somebody like me, I don't even have a, I didn't even graduate my high school. I never definitely went to college where I'm running a multi million dollar business from my apartment. And, you know, and I'm running circles around some of these big brands right now and these big companies. Because they just can't keep up with the creativity and the speed of implementation that my company has. Yeah. So talk a little bit about – because I've, I've talked with Direct Whitman about copywriting. He's the features and benefits. He's the Dr. Direct. Uh, and you talk with people who – who, who, who put – everyone has their own spin on, on how they're teaching things. How did you settle on this idea of the school of hidden knowledge, this sort of like – occulted aspect of of like of literally of, of hidden knowledge like why why did you go this approach and how did you like you know it's obviously working 
but but how did you hit on it? Well, for me, it was like this stuff is hidden. It's there's not people teaching it for me. There wasn't like I have. If you look at my library, I have like stuff like ev evolutionary, you know, psychology. I have all Joseph Campbell's book. I have the power of myth, the anatomy, the anatomy of a psyche. This isn't stuff I learned in marketing books. This is stuff I put together from very, very high, high these these sources that are esoteric and are uh, you you know collegiate are hard to digest and hard to process. But once I was able to understand it, I've spent the past decade of my life reading these books and understanding it and applying it to my own brain. And once I applied that to marketing, I realized this is hidden knowledge. This is very, very hidden knowledge. And there's not to say features and benefits don't, they're not powerful. because they, they have their powerful. place. Yeah. They have their place. And I'll tell you exactly where their place is. There's three different brains inside the human brain. This is a theory called the, the, um, the uh, triune brain theory. So there's the reptilian part of the brain, the mammalian part of the brain, and then the uh, the uh, human, the neocortex part of the brain, which is the newest part of the brain. It's the newest part. It's, it's obviously human beings are very new to the evolutionary chain. So the oldest part is the reptilian part because we sprung from the reptiles, evolutionary sp speaking. So that's fight or flight. That's protect your family. That's why the tactical flashlight was so powerful and impactful because it was speaking to the reptilian part of the brain. Now, the brain that's the second part that's powerful because obviously we were from reptile to mammal and we've been mammals longer than we were humans, you know, in the evolutionary timeline. So if you speak to that brain, that's where you're talking about acceptance, tribal acceptance, pack acceptance, hierarchy. OK, so that's when you that's when you're talking about the BMWs, the Bentleys. The Mercedes, the Mercedes, 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 the Louis Vuitton, those types of high brands that speak to those types of status. accepted status. Yeah. And that's why you see so much power in that type of stuff. And then you see the lowest level for marketing, which is features and benefits, which is talking to the human part, which is the logic and reason, which is the least powerful part of our brain. Our whole brain is, is governed by emotions and fight or flight and this reptilian part. But we have this relatively new part of our brain. But the problem is that this is how marketers are marketing. We're saying features and benefits. We're saying, you know, this flashlight has 15 lumens and it has an on and off. You know, it's like yeah. nobody gives a fuck. They, it's like they care about whether or not the right flashlight to protect their family. Yeah. But that's what features and benefits are for me. But there is a, the, the, and how I structure it is I hit them with the emotions first. I hit them with the tribal acceptance second. And then I hit them with a few features and benefits because they've got to go through their, their there's a there's uh, Antonio Damasio talks about this. He's a neuroscientist uh, and he talks about how decision making goes through the emotional part of our brain first. And I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm butchering this explanation. He has a book called uh, Descartes Error. Antonio Damasio, got to read it. And he talks about how all of our decision making is processed through the emotional part of our brain. So we can't even make a decision. In fact, there's people with brain damage that have that part of their brain damage that can't even make a logical decision if it hasn't passed through that emotional part of their brain yet. It's meaning that if we're not hitting them on an emotional level, we're failing. We're failing big time and we're not going to get the conversion. And when it relates to how it affects us directly and what we do, we're not going to get the conversions. We're not going to get the profit. We're not going to be able to scale and we're not going to be eating sushi and fucking making big stacks of cash like we all like to do in this industry. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. That's really, really, really interesting. And, and yeah, Descartes, like I was really into Descartes when I was uh, when I was in school and this the idea of uh, the brain in the vat, essentially the I think therefore I am the uh, I think as, like a yeah, sopalistic yeah, yeah. sort of worldview where it's like we are, you know, we th th that it's, it's, it's also it's also like a simplified version of the matrix, which is the idea that all of this is is some sort of simulation simulation. And for all have we you, know, have we you read Bouillard? Who have you read Simulation Simulacra? Bouillard? No. Ah, uh, bro, you got to read that book. It's basically like Plato's The Cave yep. on steroids. And it's, dude, it's, you got to read, it's basically how everything that we have in our world is just a symbol of a symbol. And we don't hunt anymore. We go and like buy prepackaged food from the supermarket and how we're so far removed from the actual real world. And that's where the base of the Matrix comes from. They like, that's one of the books that influenced the actual Matrix is Bouillard, a lot hmm. of Bouillard's work. And he talks about how, we're just a simulation of a sim. We're a photocopy of a photo of a copy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a real actual civilization, and how if we understand that as marketers, we can tap so far deep into the mind that we're fucking making so much fucking money, dude. I'm like, dude. I, 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 the reason why I'm not making a hundred million a year is just simply like cash flow at this point. It has nothing to do with like 
anything beyond that. It's just like we're just printing money at this point once we figured it out. Super, super interesting. So you gotta you gotta go through these various levels. You gotta sort of plumb the depths. You might you don't mind if I smoke weed, do you? Yeah, no, that's <laughs> uh, uh, bud, little bud. It's a good conversation. I'm it is. I'm here. Get right. Oh, I wish I don't. I don't have my one hitter on me. It's uh, it's out of my bag there. But let's let's just jump tracks, just because you you forced the issue here. Let's talk a little bit about. Uh, you know, I heard I heard through some friends. You know, on a thing a lot of people I know are experimenting with microdosing. A lot of people are experimenting with tweaking their their chemistry in certain ways in order to sort of optimize their behavior. I I I enjoy my weed, and I don't know. It's also like I'm in Victoria, BC, where there's as many, uh, you know, there's more more or less Starbucks than there are dispensaries here in Victoria. And you're you're is it legal in Nevada as well? Yeah, it just became it's super legal here. It's awesome. Nice. Yeah. And so how what what. What do you like? How does it relate to your marketing creativity, or your is is it something you you leverage, or is it just something you like to do? Yeah. Well, you know, I smoke a lot of weed for relaxation. Some people do, you know. I'm not saying to do it or not to do it. I know that almost every marketer I know smokes a lot of weed. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, and then as for the microdosing, I'm on and off about it. I don't see huge differences in it. I just like the idea of it. I do more of like actual dosing of acid. And that's fun. Um, and I've got doses. some good insights. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, I'm a big, uh, like, and not so much as much anymore. Like, I used to, but I've done a lot of acid and, you know, shrooms and DMT and ecstasy. And I, maybe I shouldn't even keep going. But, you know, I've, I've done it all and I love it all. And I think each of it has its place and shouldn't be frowned down upon necessarily as long as you're responsible and do it with the right setting. Um, I love it. I think that it expands consciousness. It's helped me think about things in a different way. Um, I clearly am uh, quite an eccentric person, and I, I think that's part of it was because I've done a lot of these mind-expanding you know, drugs that have helped me kind of see the world from a different filter and a different lens. That's the best way to describe it. It just kind of gives you a different lens or filter, like an Instagram filter, and you're like, ah, dude, I, that's a cool way of seeing the world. I, it's in, the same world. It's just a different way of looking at it. In a way, to me, it, it, I, I keep trying to put this together in words, but it's like we have the, these ideas that uh, that there are these hidden powers, that there are these, you know, there is a way of viewing the universe that that is above the material or that's or below the material sense of the world. And it's almost like drugs in a way clue you into that in a way that allow you to sort of access it going forward. It allows you to access that mindset. It allows you to access that level of archetype in a way that maybe you couldn't if you were sober. Yeah, I mean, there's so many layers. I mean, even the understanding the layers of how the brain works, that's mind expanding. There's so many ways of expanding your mind and I feel like there's that goes back to the hidden knowledge. There's so few people talking about this. Now there is more and more, and I think that's great. Uh, but it's it's something that I think we should be excited, especially in, in our and, and as marketers, like we're not robots. This is what's going to keep us competitive as automation takes over is our ability to keep expanding our consciousness and our ability to think way outside of these different reality patterns, because all artificial intelligence I can do, I, I can do right now as of now is work within these these environments that we've already established but when they like machines aren't dropping acid not yet not until uh, strong ai drops acid that would be a trip dude well the book uh the age of spiritual machines i have the uh, rakers wild the singularities near oh here it is the age of uh spiritual machines that's that's the one you got to read where hey maybe maybe machines will be dropping acid we may they may be our future religious leaders. We may be worshiping. It's not there yet. And until but you, until then, that's how I would say creative is just doing these things that are going to help me. These I see them as exercises that help me stay looking at the world a different way. And I think that that is what makes us above average in what we do. I think it's also I, I think you it's it's important to to like have have a good, a healthy amount of respect for them. I, you know when, when you drop acid when you're in high school or or do mushrooms during high school, it's this wild sort of like hedonistic trip kind of thing. But I feel like yeah. intentionality is really important as you get older when you when you tap into these things, that you really sort of have something in mind as to why you're doing it, what you hope to get out of it, uh, and, and, and and treat it with a, with a healthy dose, dose of respect because they're extremely powerful substances. Absolutely. Uh, well, you know, you got to be careful because with just like with anything, with alcohol, with too much caffeine, too much Red Bull, you can if you do it too much, you can hurt yourself, hurt other people. And that's what then that's what gives the whole thing a bad reputation and bad. If you do it 
and you, you you do your research and you do you know your dosage and you do it in a safe space and you're not doing it as a way to you know there's always there's restrictions limitations as long as you know yourself i think experiment away go to burning man is a good place to do it go to these you know uh transform transformative festivals all around the world that's happening and i think you're gonna find some great people and the good thing is most of these people like you go to burning man you're going to run into a billion dollar, million dollar, multi-million dollar business owner. You know, like there's a reason why high level people do that type of stuff. Yeah. And it, it so what what do you think this is a broad question, but what do you think's going down right now? So, I've been listening to I've been listening to some podcasts right now. I've been I've actually been listening I listen I've been listening to a lot of podcasts about Vegas. I've been I've been trying to parse what's going on with this situation in Vegas right now. And I was listening to one last night that was talking a lot about the context about what's happening in Vegas and literally like how receipts across the board in Vegas are down right now. That like these traditional sort of even these giant casino conglomerates are are feeling the pinch that Sears is feeling and that like that the that these big established companies are 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 like it's like as people wake up in in certain ways the old institutions are losing some of their potency is is that something that you're feeling you know in the United States what are you what are you feeling on the ground in Vegas like what's the what's the mindset there well I see Vegas is is popping right now I love Vegas I see it as like a, it's it's come back in my opinion but overall where I see like shit's going down is first off. People don't have the buying power because we have millennials that are trapped in student loan debt. So, I mean, I, I think that if we didn't like Generation Xers had like what, like maybe ten thousand dollars that they were unlucky in student loan debt. And we have millennials with one hundred thousand dollars plus in student loan debt. So they just simply can't even go to Vegas and enjoy themselves, which is unfortunate. And so I think what we're going to see is these old institutions uh, crumble. So we're going to see the education institutions like universities, these these old school, traditional well-established industry we're gonna see places like postmodernist. Like yeah yeah we're gonna well we're gonna see that crumble yeah postmodern we're gonna see that crumble we're gonna see um we're gonna see non-traditional stuff flourish like non-traditional business non-traditional e like e-commerce businesses like us that aren't traditionally can't put your finger on us you can't you know sum us up in one in one textbook and so what's gonna be happening is you're, you're gonna have we have this this we have to change. We can't just keep putting a whole generation of students into student loan debt for jobs that don't exist and will never exist anymore. And until that implosion happens and we can restructure our society, like we're going to be the titans of the new world. And right now is our opportunity to like stack, stack, stack and grow, grow, grow. So when the, the economy does collapse, which it will collapse soon, we're in a position to actually expand our wealth by buying hard assets. That's why I tell like internet marketers that are making over a million dollars a year, don't be a fuck boy and buy a Bentley. Like stack your money, buy buy assets, buy apartment complexes, be prepared. Now, when you say the crash is coming, do you say are you saying like 2008 or you're saying like no, like a, like an actual system reset? Like because so, like, 2008 was a blip, really. Yeah, 2008 was not a system it reset. Was, it, we it just, was a yeah. wealth. It was wealth transfer. It was another giant wealth transfer to the you know from from the middle class up basically i feel like right. wow. and it pushed people further down into the margins pushed the one percent higher uh into or the point one zero 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 one percent potentially higher but what what do you what do you forecast you're, you're you're thinking that that we're headed to something much more serious than 2008 i mean the numbers are on the wall we have 1.9 trillion dollars of student loan debt we have uh baby boomers that can't read they don't simply don't have the money to retire they're working until they die we have the auto industry that's collapsing because of ride share. We don't have people buying cars like we used to. They, you can't afford them anyway. We have traditional education collapsing. We have Dodd Frank that just got, uh, got so basically they're about to you know ease up on lending regulation, which just like what happened right before the housing market collapse, we had what four or five years of credit glut, which is just about to open up, and I see it opening up right now. Um, you know, it's not looking good. It's not. We don't have home ownership at a high rate. I mean, there's nothing about the economy that signals a very strong, healthy uh, automation taking jobs. Except the stock market, right? Like the stock the, market is soaring. Well, the stock market's soaring because so many of these companies are leveraging automation and laying off employees yeah. and seeing record profits. And, so. and concentrating wealth further up. And concentrating wealth further up. So I wouldn't see that as an indicator of a strong economy. I would see, you know, what's going on with them. Like if you talk to the average millennial, they're at they're living at home. There's sixty thousand dollars in student loan debt, and they 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 have no. They're thirty years old, and they have no savings. 
So not a recipe for a new golden era. No, I don't think so. And I, I think it's going to be a golden era for guys like us that are non-traditionalists that are able to see the patterns on the wall, that are able to build systems, build online businesses, accumulate wealth, and then use that time of this next great recession that's going to hit and use that time to consolidate our wealth. But if you're going to be a fuck boy about your money, you know, yachts and travel, like I love travel. I love doing this. But like there's like, you know, I've seen a lot of people that just spend their money like it's no tomorrow, which I've, you know, I've done it before. I love spending my money, but I do see it as a time to conserve, build wealth, buy apartment complexes, buy stuff that's that's going to be wealth enhancing. And then, you know, when they when they all shit breaks loose, we're fucking balling or all of us will be balling in this industry. I see it as like this is the best industry to be in. And that's what people do in crises, too. I was just reading a, an article, an entrepreneur, Kam Rizra. I just connected with him, and he, he wrote an article specifically about, like, when the world is falling apart, that's when the smart people buy. They make money on the buying and right the selling at that point. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready, dude. I'm ready. I, I'm not starting to sound like a carpetbagger, but I'm fucking ready for this collapse, man. Yeah. Interesting. So, so what – what what else do you have on the go here? Like, what are you what are you building towards right now? Are you are you you're also running straight up affiliate campaigns as well? What's your favorite oh, yeah, traffic source yeah. these days? I love Facebook. I mean, I love YouTube. We're doing a lot of YouTube. We're doing a lot of Instagram. We're doing a lot of Facebook. Those are our three main things uh, that we run. Um, but you know, Facebook's big data. If as long as you stay compliant, you can leverage their big data algorithm, and it's just incredible. It's I think it's one of the to look from traffic sources available to us right now cool uh what i wanted to ask you another i just the, a term that keeps getting cup popping up in my feed all the time right now i actually ended up on a uh, a big thread on it yesterday what does the term red pill mean to you oh man that's a loaded question because everyone has their definition of what red pill i just think that means just being to me it just means being aware woke. that just being aware just being woke just staying woke just staying woke, woke to like the system like, understand the system's not your friend. The government's not your friend. Nah, the only person that's going to be you're, you're taking care of you is you. And uh, to me, being woke is just take, building systems and building wealth. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, not, no, I have no, no person uh, that hold, be held accountable except for me. And to me, that's the ultimate sign of woke. Because there's a lot of people that say they're woke, but their sign of woke is being a victim. Being a yeah. victim of circumstance. And that's not my definition of woke. That's interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask you, where do you like? It, it, uh, I'm not 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 necessarily you're a political like where you stand on the political standpoint, but what do you make you know from this perspective we've been speaking about of Trump? Do you feel like Trump is someone who is is putting a, a gears in in the machine or putting a wrench in the machine that has been churning along for years and years and years, or is he just another layer? Is he is he like a um, a destabilizing element that's sort of like in the system and, and he's sort of part of the way the system wants to go or it, it, like what, how do what's your read on Trump? I'm curious. Well, well Trump, Trump is just, uh, he's a joker. He's a wild card, not joker in the sense of like, he's like a, like a clown. The I mean, more like he's the archetype of the wild card. I'm not saying he's good or bad, but like at the end of the day, no one person understands this economy. If anyone's going to tell you they're going to fix the economy, they're going to bring jobs back. How are you going to bring jobs back? I going to bring all cool. the being it's being automated. The bottom line is like you can't. I, I just listen to that. I see Trump as a for, he's funny. He's a funny guy. He like cuts through the shit of the of the political clutter. I like that about him. At the end of the day, I don't see him as any type of savior or any type of leader that I'm going to be like. I'm going to follow that person as like my end all, you know, resource of how to live my life. Like the guy is just a character. He, uh, I think he, I think he realizes that. The presidential role, you don't really have a lot of power, and uh, he Except plays it up. He can nuke. He can nuke, <laughs> he but like, you know, at the end of the day, that's like, that is true. That is kind of weird. We do have a kind of a weird way that we that we distribute power here in America. You know, I, I don't know. I can't change. All I know is I can change myself. I'm going to move to Puerto Rico, get that 4% tax rate. I don't think anyone's going to nuke Puerto Rico. I try to stay neutral and just pump my cash, you know what I mean? Let other people argue and be broke. Yeah. Now, I like that. So we talked a little bit about this, but in your mind, give me some – so if you're marketing – if you're trying to market shit in America, uh, like what is what is this sort of like 
so say you're trying to market to middle America right now. You're trying to 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 not, not you're not trying to mark. I try to market to marketers essentially, but you're trying to market to the huddled masses, the people coming up, the young people who are disillusioned. Yeah. What in your mind, like what mindset are you are you attributing to them? I guess there's probably lots of different ones depending on what you're. But like, give me an overall picture of 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 what of some of the things you're trying to tap into if you're trying to market to to the youth of America right now. Okay, well, I think the average person has like point seven five fr- best friends. That's like something I don't quote, but something around that. It's like really sad. But, you know, what I do is whatever vertical that I'm going into, I will spend two days, two to three days going into like watching YouTube videos, describe like, for example, I made a couple million dollars in student debt. So I must have spent like 36 hours. Um, it's maybe probably more like 100 hours watching just YouTube videos of people describing their struggle with student debt. So they're like, I, I just would my struggle student debt like on YouTube and people have like their vlogs or whatever. They're like day one of my struggle, day 40 of my, you know, whatever. And I would watch those, take notes and really start to understand the vernacular that they use, the type of person they are, their struggles. So like student debt, for example, like they couldn't move out of their parents home. They couldn't buy a car. They couldn't own a home, you know. 50% of their paychecks going to a student loan bill. You know, their job that they have was probably they could have gotten without the, the degree and they're miserable and they don't see any way out of this debt. So, like, you know, obviously it's kind of an easier one, but every industry has their their major pain points that if you really focus on that vertical and on that industry, then, you know, even something like solar, they, these people have specific pain points and specific things that you can really, really get into and understand about that consumer and, and put that in your copy. Hmm. So to answer your question, I know it's like there's not one broad stroke way of describing middle America because I, I think what the Internet has done has created hyper partisanship. So middle of like there's no such thing as middle America anymore. There's just people that are online that are getting on these online groups becoming hyper conservative, hyper liberal, hyper libertarian hyper, you know, republic, all these things. And if you tap into those little demographics pockets and understand those those tribal things that they do, so going into the mammalian part of their brain, then you'll make a lot of money. Yeah. And and then there's this whole other group of people, these like disaffected, like the disaffected yeah. youth that have sort of slipped into a form of nihilism, I almost feel like. And that's right. I'm on Reddit all the time and I feel like those are the the dank those are the dank people, you know, the, the ones making wild memes and, you know, like playing around with racism because it's provocative. And even though they're probably right. not racist, but they're throwing right. around sort of like, that's like where the, the frog kind of comes from. It's sort of it's it's amazing the way communication is evolving so rapidly uh, and people are, are sort of getting so detached from from meaning in a lot of different ways. It's funny, the hyper partisanship is happening and it's happening right alongside this weird disillusion. I just feel like I feel like in America and the world right now, there's a high degree of cognitive dissonance. I feel like there's people who have who are sort of having in their daily life to hold very different ideas of, of the way the world works. It's like they see that the old models aren't working. They don't quite know what the new ways are. Uh, I feel it's a really strange time to be alive. Yeah, well, you know, we have our own hyperpartisanship within our industry. You know, we have our own, you know, way of talking, CPM, CPLs, you know, our own thing. You know, affiliates, we do our own thing, you know, the stack that money and I stack and all this stuff. We have our terms. And I think that our industry that we're in, we're in a very good community. We're in a very good tribe. I don't see there's a better tribe out there to be involved in. And as long as we, we, we you know, stay in our, you know, stay in this industry, in my opinion, I don't, I think... All of us are good. Uh, unfortunately, I see it's going to be suffering for a lot of other people. But the good thing is, for us, it won't be. Yeah, I think I, I think there's and, and 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 putting ourselves in positions, especially to be leaders and trainers, you know, to help bring people in, uh, to, you know, to to this this sort of new paradigm. I think it's it's probably a pretty good position to be in. What totally. now, now? One of the things that we walk the line on is the difference between sort of like skills-based training and biz op. And I know in order to make real money, you have to be able to take your product and you have to be able to take it to the general market. Uh, you have to have ways. I, like, you know, a lot of our marketing is we call in-group marketing because it's basically like people know STM, people know Affiliate World Conferences. They know us because of them and we're kind of getting in their face a lot. Uh, but like, what? how do you walk that line in terms of, 
uh, you know, the biz op versus versus you know versus like skills training. Okay, because that's a tough one because you know we're we're in an industry that you know people want. It's got to be a little combination of both. People want the skills based training, but at the same time, if you just give them a skill, it it's not the best way of training. Like Elon Musk has a very very good uh, philosophy on education where he says somebody needs to see a working model first. Um, before they actually conceptually understand how that how that functions. So like you can't expect somebody to build an engine just under by researching the, the concepts behind it. They need to see how the a actual car. working the work. Yeah. And like pick it apart and break probably it. a Ferrari. Yeah. Well, probably for our yeah. And so I think that like it's a tough because we got to draw. There's a lot of like bad business opportunities. There's a lot of bad opportunities out there. Just straight up just scammers. We'll call it what it is. And I think that like what you guys do um, is such a high level quality of education. Um, and that's hard to do because the industry is moving so quickly. You know, what you put out today isn't necessarily going to work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to uh, BizOp versus uh, the, what was it? BizOp versus skills based the, uh, training. Skills -based it's, yeah. training. You know, I don't, I, it's hard to look at it from the lens of either. It's kind yeah. of, we have to invent this kind of new way of training. I see it as like mastermind. Yep. You know, and uh, and uh, this time, I don't know if there is a word for it. I wouldn't call it biz op. I wouldn't call it a skills based training either. It's not and, and it's I, not a money making system either. It's not necessarily, a money system. But it is yeah. a hybrid of that. And I realize that right. having done the amount of webinars we've done at this point and having done the cold traffic funnels that we're building, like you have to be able to dangle the vision. First of all, oh, you absolutely. have to be, you have to dangle the vision of what it's like. And, and it's, it, you know, we're, we're privileged because we've been in this industry for a while and we've seen it transform people's lives. We've had it transform our own lives in, in different ways. So it's not like we're not coming from a false profit type position, you know, like we we actually, this, we see this shit work all the time and we're living it. Okay. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it is an, it's an, I find it's an interesting line to walk for sure. Yeah, and it's this is a new paradigm. It's new. It's obviously the old, the old ways of viewing education doesn't work anymore, you know. And we're on the forefront of inventing a new way of education, a new way of sh knowledge transfer, and a new way of 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 create you know creating a system to actually teach people real stuff that works that isn't um, just theories that that are a photocopy of a photocopy that some professor that drives, drives a Volvo is trying to show in a PowerPoint presentation to a bunch of stoned, you know, 19 year olds. Yeah. So it's, it's new, you know, we're, 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 we're pioneers in a way in that sense. And, uh, some people don't like the whole guru thing. I get a lot of guru hate and I get it. There's a lot of sh shit out there, but at the same time, I think the best way of doing it is supporting the good training, like the stuff that you guys put out. And like and like supporting that and, and like creating a real community around quality training and then making it harder barrier of entry for just the bad stuff to, to come in and 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 make the the, the actual quality education in this industry um, look bad. Because bottom line, people need education. You can't just expect people not to have education. They're hungry for it. Somebody's going to provide it. It's either going to be somebody that provides great education or somebody that is providing subpar scam crap education. And we need to fill that upper void in that marketplace. It's just what it comes down to. And you touched on it too. A community is such a big part of it. I was, I was, I was out. I played ball hockey every week, and I was out with my friends last night. And they were, they work different jobs. Some of them are middle managers. Some of them are in government. Some of them are landscapers or whatever. But I was, I was like recounting my day, and it was like, well, I spent you know an hour reading up on this, and then I, then I engaged the, the community in a forum and had like. 30 people respond to me and we had a dialogue back and forth about something and like it is like it's it's easy to take the community that we have for granted but the, totally. the people that you meet in this business who are all striving for self-improvement they're all striving to improve their businesses they're all taking it fully upon themselves they're not waiting for a promotion necessarily they're creating this out of nothing it's uh it's been a huge eye-opener for me and especially this jump that i've made into this sort of the iStack family working with uh, the STM crew and, and, and all the people I'm meeting through this. It's really privileged. And I also like have a daily ping pong rival with like my, my, uh, the guy that I've hired here, Andrew, to do our marketing. And it's like, they're like, you play, like, what, what is your job title? You, you get to play ping pong for, you know, awesome. a little bit. I'm like, you just got to get up and move around, right? You got to like. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, so here's, here's my most important question. What are you going to be for Halloween? Uh, I'm not George Lopez, <laughs> I think. <laughs> 
I'm gonna try that one out. That's so. What are you? What are you gonna do? There, you just gonna rip off other people's jokes, or? Uh, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna, you know, I like wear it. suits. Yeah, very. Cool. I look like George Lopez. So oh, I, I, I get it. it <laughs> I'm yeah. gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Let himself go. That's what I'm oh, gonna do. Stone Cold. Are you gonna do suck it? Are you gonna go around saying suck? I'm it? gonna say suck it. I'm gonna be drinking like I gotta get Keystone Light, and I don't I'm know, gonna just bro, be... with all the Weinstein shit going around, dude. Just all the dude. all these institutions are crumbling, right? All They're these crumbling. Yeah, it's a it is a wild time. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. so and so, what's our final words to people? We want to urge people to go out there and explore the the archetypal things that kind of live below the surface. Think about the brain. In uh, with these three different ways from the, the reptilian brain to the mammalian brain to the neocortex and have your marketing kind of permeate right down to that level. Yeah. And in a nutshell, people always ask me what books uh, I'm going to get this question. I know so I, I, a hundred times. So uh, read anything by Carl Jung, read anything by Edward Bernays, read anything by Ogilvy on advertising. Um, and I think you'll be you'll be good. And also um, uh, Joseph Campbell. And then you can even watch Joseph Campbell has some great stuff like uh, Shuk Davi or whatever. I can't remember. It's on Amazon. It's like a DVD. You, you can actually watch Joseph Campbell DVDs on Amazon or watch his lectures. Good stuff. And, uh, you know, just jump in. You know, we have a life is too short to get rich slow. And we're in a gifted and uh, a privileged industry and in a privileged spot in humanity. And, you know, you don't want to be that person that misses the good times and wishes that you could go back in time and redo it. That's that's something that that we're obviously in our marketing we play on quite a bit. Is this you know we're 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 marketing to marketers. It's everyone knows we're in this kind of gold rush that's happening right now, and it's this idea of like, hey, here here's here's the best path. Here's the best the best knowledge you can kind of acquire in order to do this, and you don't want to miss out on it. You don't want to you don't. It's this FOMO, this idea of you do you don't really want to miss out on these experiences while they're happening because you don't you want to make because and everyone wonders, am I making the most of this opportunity? Am I am I sharpening my skills in the right way and I think that's uh, that's something that people should keep in mind. So, but speaking about good experiences, this is something else I like to discuss towards the end of the podcast. What are what are some things besides grinding and 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 building your wealth and and spending it wisely? What are some of the things that like float your boat? Like what do you and, and pot and and things like that as well? But what what are some things that you sort of like strive for? What are some of the peak experiences that you that you're out there trying to have on the weekends or when you travel or like what do you love doing? Dude, I I love this family relationships. I have a beautiful girlfriend who's my fiance now. Well, not if she yet very soon. I've been with her for nine years, so it's weird to call her my girlfriend. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind of like okay, but uh, I love. I have a great family, so I spend time with just the stuff that makes human beings happy. Man, like family, uh, travel. Love to travel. I'm constantly traveling. I love eating sushi, eating well, and I love knowing that I'm creating a real future for not just me. Because it's easy to do, but also for like my parents who, you know, they want, I want them to have a comfortable retirement. My in-laws, I actually do like my in-laws. Nice. And, Important. You know, I just, I try to be a good person, man. I just try to be a good person. And my, my girlfriend just calls me a, a chubby, chubby, happy guy. <laughs> that's it. Nice. Well, that's a hell of a persona. I think you should yeah. stick with it. Uh, Ronnie, thanks so much for coming on The Robust Marketer today. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Uh, connect with me on Facebook, Ronnie Sandlin, or Instagram. What a fucking life! What a fucking life! What or a fucking life! Just Google me. Can I, there's a, I'm easy to find. Come find me, and I, I'd love to just share with you and have you as a part of the community that we have over here. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank Thanks, you for Ronnie. The have a happy Halloween. All right. You too. Take care. Bye bye.